uh, our next speaker, uh, Alexander Rockin, from the University of Pennsylvania, but he's visiting at, at MIT. Actually, your PhD is from MIT, too, I believe. So in that sense, he's sort of local. And he does things about machine learning and some and sequential sort of statistical analysis, which is quite uh, interesting. And he's going to have a book out, it says on your website, uh, 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 soon. That's right. so, That's very good. So, thank you. Uh, thanks for the invitation. Thanks for the introduction. Um, pleasure to be here. Um, I'm going to talk about work with uh, Karthik Sridharan. Um, and uh, indeed, we're writing a, a, a book. But um, we've been working for quite some time on these online prediction methods. And what I will present today is just a, just a very, very basic uh, set of results um, through the lens of some 1965 result by Tom Cover. Um, and um, uh, you know, if, 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 if this seems uh, simple, then uh, I've succeeded. OK, so that, that's, that's my goal. So um, um, if we think about the problem of prediction, kind of the, the typical paradigm for prediction is to you know, to, take, to get data, then to estimate a model, and then to make prediction based on the model. That's kind of a, you know, what we think about when, when, when we're faced with a problem. And um, the, the set of questions that we'll consider today is such that the, this middle step, the estimation step, is just computationally hard, provably computationally hard. And so the question is whether we can skip that step and, and, and go straight to prediction. Um, and, and the takeaway is that, yes, for, for the problems that we are going to be concerned with, this is possible. Um, and if you think about this, this is not like a completely new uh, idea. Uh, if you go back to the beginnings of machine learning in the 1960s, uh, in pattern recognition, um, it was already kind of uh, uh, pointed out that you know, if, if you want to distinguish male versus female faces, then maybe you don't have to model the distributions of the males and females. The, the, the faces in this high dimensional space rather than you just go for the boundary between these two um, if, if the prediction is your goal. Of course, if inference is your goal, if you're, if, if you're trying to infer parameters, then you should be um, doing the estimation part, right? So the, the question is whether we can skip this part. Um, and, and the kind of the running example that I would like you to have in mind uh, is the following uh, one. Um, uh, we're going to be looking at problems with combinatorial structure. And, and this, is, this is one application. So imagine that you have a network. Um, let's just say it's a fixed network. And um, one by one, a person opens their Facebook uh, account, Facebook page. And uh, the application that you're developing should classify this person as you know, 0, 1, or minus 1, 1, um, or maybe multi-class classification with the hope of deciding on, a, on which ad to display and so forth, okay? Um, and, um, and then you go, to the, uh, you go to the next person and, and, and the next person and the next person. And so the prediction that you make for, for each uh, individual should be based on some side information for this person, what, what you know, the gender, the age, and so forth about the person. Um, you also would like to take into account the connectivity of the network, the global and the local structures. Um, the position of the person within the network, um, but also the information that you've gathered so far. In other words, you, know, what, what, you already know that this person uh, um, clicked on the ad or did not click on the ad, and so after you make the prediction, you actually get some information. And so uh, you know, the, the, the question is, you know, what, what, what kind of uh, algorithms are available? And, and examples of this, I'm not going to go into the details, but you can think of ad placement, um, where the network is a network of friends and you, you want to leverage the connectivity of the network. Um, uh, you want to do product recommendations. There are trust-distrust networks such as the opinions data set where people say, I, I don't trust the reviews of this person. So that you can think of that as a negative edge, negative weight edge. Um, uh, personal medicine and, and so forth. Um, so, so how should we model the problem um, and, and uh, what are the computationally feasible prediction methods, right? So the goal is to make predictions of these nodes and what, are, what is the space of prediction methods? And, um, you know, if you're coming from machine learning, you're going to say, well, we're going to take a deep neural network or, or a support vector machine or whatever and just throw at it. And, and the, the question is, is that the, the kind of the, the right thing to do? Is that the best possible 
Uh, and is there a, a completely different approach to this problem? Um, and and the, once again, the, the kind of the running theme uh, is estimation versus prediction. Can we bypass the, pr the step of estimation and go directly for a prediction? In the language of uh, in the machine learning community, these are called proper versus improper uh, uh, predictions or proper versus improper learning. Proper being I give out uh, a prediction which is based on some estimated model. And the improper just says, well, I, I don't have to be consistent with any model that I'm estimating. Um, uh, we're going to be modeling solutions to the problem rather than the process that generates the data. And once again, if you go back to, to this example, you know, you can think of putting down, writing down a complicated uh, probabilistic model for this, but uh, because of the interactions and dependencies, this model is unlikely to be uh, uh, true. Okay? Of course, it could be useful for prediction, um, and then it comes down to the experiments, but it's unlikely to be true in, 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 in practice. Uh, so things are stochastic block models, they're beautiful mathematically, uh, but uh, probably not relevant for this particular example. Um, and, and what we're going to have is, is gonna, we're going to have a knob for trading off computation and uh, uh, the statistical performance. So you can decide how much time you spend. Okay, so uh, let me go uh, into a bit more details. Um, still at the high level, this is what we're going to... Um, to achieve. So if, if, if you think of this online prediction uh, setting, uh, you can c collect your prediction errors. Uh, you can count the number of mistakes that you've made. And if you're not concerned with computation, then kind of an oracle model, uh, an oracle um, inequality would look like prediction error is bounded by the error of the oracle that had the knowledge of all the data in hindsight. Okay, what, what could you do in hindsight? plus some kind of a uh, order, uh, little O of one remainder. And of course, what uh, you know, people obsess about is how fast this little O of one goes to zero. That's the sample complexity. Um, and, and, and the question is, if this oracle error is, you can't even estimate this oracle error because of the combinatorial structure. Um, what people have proposed, and this, this in particular I'm referring to the work by uh, Kakari and uh, uh, Adam Kalai, uh, Sham Kakari and uh, Adam Kalai and, and Katrina, Katrina Ligat, is that if you have a multiplicative approximation for the oracle loss, then you can get a prediction error bounded by this alpha times the oracle error plus the remainder. But uh, this bound uh, very quickly becomes vacuous. Uh, so think of oracle error as 2% error, and alpha is, you know, for things like... Uh, uh, sparsest cut or some other combinatorial problems like log n or square root of log n. Right? So, so this bound very quickly becomes uh, vacuous. And so what we're going to uh, uh, get by avoiding, uh, by avoiding um, estimating the model, we're going to get something of this form where the prediction error is bounded by the oracle error and this alpha multiplier, the approximation, only enters in the lower, in the lower order uh, term. And it kind of seems crazy to, to, to get such a result, and I think when, once we got the result, we, we were uh, relatively surprised. But we, we, um, I will present the, the ideas in such a simple way that you will just say, well, this is trivial. Okay? You, you will see why, the, why, the, why this uh, comes out. Um, and to present the result in, in, in the simplest possible way, I'm going to turn to uh, this result by Cover in 1965. Uh, um, transactions of the fourth Prague conference. Um, uh, this, this paper is not uh, well cited, as you can see if you look at the uh, scholar. Uh, this is 71 citations. I guess a year ago this was 71, maybe more. Um, you know, for machine learning standards, this is a, uh, like a month-old paper, right? Uh, um, uh, but I think it should be better known. Um, so consider the following problem. Let, let's be more mathematically precise. Uh, we have a bit sequence, y1 through yn, and, and the sequence takes that each, each bit is, minus, is assigned bit, minus 1, 1. And we're going to make sequential predictions, right? So think of this making predictions at the nodes, and the predictions are taking values in also minus 1, 1, and then we are uh, looking at the proportion of mistakes. So our goal is to have small proportion of mistakes in predicting this sequence. There is no covariance right now, there is no graph, nothing. This is just the simplest possible version. You're trying to predict a bit sequence. Um, so y hat will stand for a strategy, and 
it's a causal strategy in the, in the sense that it only depends on the observations so far. So the protocol is that you make a prediction y hat, and then you observe the, the actual bit. Okay, you make a prediction, you observe the bit. You make a prediction, you observe the bit. Um, so I'm not writing y hat t of y1 through yt minus 1, but this is to be understood. Okay. So uh, you're looking at this, uh, you would like to get a small proportion of mistakes. Um, now fix an algorithm. So take an algorithm A, and the claim, which is relatively simple, is that um, you know, the, an algorithm is better on some sequences and worse on some other sequences. So think of all the possible sequences as vertices of the hypercube uh, in the n dimension. Uh, n is the length of the prediction problem. Okay? Um, and, and so any algorithm has to be better on some sequences, but at the expense of being worse on some other sequences. On average, over two to the n sequences, the expected error has to be uh, one half. Okay? It's a simple argument. You have to kind of develop this expectation backwards. Um, uh, but, uh, kind of a simple argument. Okay? So any algorithm, if it's better on some sequence, it has to be worse on some other sequence. Um, now, the, 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 what's, what's interesting is the converse. If I tell you which sequences I care about, okay, if I specify which sequences I'm likely to see or which I care about, can you construct an algorithm? All right, so this is a converse, uh, con converse question. Okay? So let's say uh, that a function phi of a sequence is achievable if there exists a randomized strategy. By the way, our strategy for prediction has to be randomized uh, because we would like to get a, a result that holds for any sequence. And if you fix a deterministic algorithm, you can always just flip the prediction in a way to, uh, to, to, to get uh, uh, an average error of one. So the question is, does there exist a randomized strategy such that for any sequence of bits, the expected average loss of the prediction strategy is bounded by that function phi of the sequence? Okay. So maybe it takes a bit of uh, time to digest, but um, we're basically asking if I fix uh, a function which tells me the number of mistakes on each vertex of the hypercube, does there exist an algorithm that gets us that uh, uh, mistake bound? Okay. And this has to hold for all sequences, and it has to hold for all sequences without any generative process on the sequences. So let's only consider su uh, functions phi such that the function is stable when you flip a coordinate. So for any coordinate, when you flip it, uh, the difference is no more than 1 over n. This is kind of a bounded difference uh, condition. Um, then the uh, kind of the observation of Tom Cover, you can prove it in, in a page maybe, uh, if you sit down for an hour. Um, a function is achievable if and only if its expected value under the uniform distribution on the hypercube is at least one half. Okay. So epsilon one through epsilon n are Radomach random variables or plus, minus, plus one minus one symmetric random variables. And um, basically what the re result of Cover says that you just need to check that the expected value of this phi function is at least one half over the hypercube under the uniform distribution. And if you succeed, if, if, if phi satisfies that, then uh, there exists an algorithm uh, that uh, achieves that mistake bound uh, at the top. Okay. So you know this is kind of a simple observation, um, and, and I don't think Tom Cover had any uh, uh, kind of. Um, any purpose for this result, but um, we, we, we're going to flip tables and we, we, we're going to say, well, I, I'm going to design this function phi. I'm going to now design my function phi using my prior knowledge about the problem. Uh, I don't care about all sequences, so I'm going to take a phi and tilt it towards the sequences that I care about uh, at the expense of being larger on some other sequences that I don't care about because I'm not going to see them. Okay, so this is kind of a modeling uh, a problem, but notice that we're not uh, modeling the probabilistic uh, uh, nature of the problem. We're not modeling the distributions, uh, the generative process of the sequences, but rather the, we're, we're modeling the set of solutions. Okay, and, and if you think uh, back to uh, you know the beginnings of machine learning, the separating hyperplane between fa male and female faces is exactly this, right? It's, it's modeling the solutions rather than the generative uh, process. 
the, rather than distributions that uh, give rise to, the, to, the, to these images. Okay, so um, this magic of Tom Covery result only happens in this particular setting uh, for binary labels, indicator loss, no covariates, and, and the stable fee. Um, and what we've been working on with Karthik and with other uh, uh, people in the community is to extend um, these results and to, get to, to have a general framework for sequential prediction uh, that characterizes you know, what, what is possible to do. Uh, um, and, and what we have is, is a way to also derive new algorithms in, for prediction. Uh, and, and these algorithms, as, as I will show, uh, appear to do very well in, in practice. So, you know, at the very least, uh, this should expand the, the toolbox of machine learning algorithms that uh, you have at your disposal for problems of sequential prediction, if nothing else. There is also, what I'm going to skip is, is this very interesting connection to empirical process theory, and what we've developed is a kind of a martingale extension of this empirical process theory. So uh, the, the online setting can be seen as a generalization of the statistical, the kind of the classical statistical learning uh, theory with you know, covering numbers, with, uh, with um, uh, fat chattering dimension, VC dimension, and so forth. Okay, so um, now, now we're looking at the construction of this function phi. So, so given the problem at hand, of course, we don't care about all sequences, so how do we construct phi in a way that matches our prior knowledge? How do we enter our prior knowledge into this function phi? So, um, well, we need to exhibit some phi such that its expected value over the hypercube is at least one half, right? And, and uh, kind of here's a canonical construction. We take a, a, a subset of the hypercube, okay? And then define uh, phi as the uh, normalized Hamming distance to this set. So that, that's a canonical construction. Okay? And this is not new. This has been uh, um, looked at uh, within the online co learning community for, for, for many, many years. Okay, so, so take a subset and then define a, a Hamming distance as the function phi. But uh, you know, if you do the calculation, the expected Hamming distance is not more than one half. If you look at the expected Hamming distance from a random point on the hypercube to the set, as soon as the set is uh, non-empty, the, the Hamming distance is, uh, expected Hamming distance is more than one, is less than one half. But you see, we, we just need to correct it by some value. So we have to correct it by some value c. Let's call it c sub n. And it turns out that this value, the smallest c sub n by which we need to correct is what is known as the width of the set f, which is the expected correlation between elements of this set f with a random direction. So if you know about Gaussian width in statistics, this is the, you know, within a constant, multiplicative constant from that, from that uh, object. And there are indeed very interesting connections, which I cannot go into, between these sequential prediction problems and very classical statistical non-parametric estimation questions. Um, so th these are Rademacher, what are called Rademacher averages from statistical learning. And, and partly, um, I think, my, my own interest in the subject of online prediction was, uh, has started uh, when uh, I, I was a postdoc with Peter Bartlett and, and we, we started looking at the questions of sequential prediction and, and the, the type of results that one would get are, look completely uh, a statistical result, but there is no generative process on the sequence. Okay, so we're just curious why this happens. Um, okay, so, so a, a, as an aside, if covariates are present, if, if when you make predictions you actually observe some side information about the person, um, then uh, kind of the relevant uh, quantity of, uh, uh, are the sequential Rademacher averages. And, and what it is, is is just expected supreme of the correlation between values of the function uh, with random signs. But uh, the XT is a, a predictable process with respect to the dyadic filtration given by these epsilons. So this creates a, a, a martingale and you're looking at the supreme of a martingale. Okay. So if you're interested in kind of the probabilistic connections, uh, between online prediction and, and uh, martingales, then, then uh, kind of you, you can look into that direction. Okay. Um, what's interesting is that the result of Cover is algorithmic. If you look at the proof, actually he never wrote down the proof, but uh, uh, you know, the, the, the proof is simple enough. If you look at the proof, um, a function phi is achievable um, 
If it is achievable, then it's given by the following strategy. So what you need to do is to compute the, the randomized strategy for the predicting, predicting plus one or minus one. So, so that strategy is just given by the mean of this distribution on plus one and minus one. So that's just the value between minus one and one, right? So you, you just need to compute the value between minus one and one. And that value is given by the expected difference of the phi function, where the phi function has the data that you've seen so far, y1 through yt minus one. Then you put a minus one, and then fill it with random coin flips. And then you subtract off the same thing, but with a plus one at the at that teeth iteration, right? So we're at the teeth uh, step of prediction. And then multiply by n just to, to, to scale it correctly. So that is the, the minimax strategy. This is the, the right thing to do if you know that phi is achievable. Um, furthermore, you don't have to do uh, expected value over these uh, future coin flips, uh, what you can do is just to draw these coin flips and then uh, just calculate the difference in these phi functions. So the phi function can be seen as a potential. And indeed, if you look at the argument, uh, it's a potential function argument. Um, how can I make predictions such that uh, at the end of the day, for any sequence, I, I, I have the number of mistakes bounded by this potential function of that sequence? And if you look at this uh, algorithm, you just need to evaluate phi twice, right, to make prediction, right? I mean, this is completely different from the classical machine learning setup where you would run some support vector machine, let's say, or a kernel method. Um, right here, you just need to, to evaluate this phi function twice. Um, and, and you see that the, this prediction is improper. I'm not, I'm not talking about consistency with any model that uh, uh, I'm trying to estimate. In particular, these uh, coin flips are not coming because I'm assuming some random coin flips on the sequence. These coin flips come out magically when you do the minimax analysis for the problem, when you write down the min-max uh, um, value of, of this prediction problem. So let me give an example. So imagine that you're, you're observing a sequence of plus ones and minus ones, and you're gonna take f to be a vertex of all ones and the vertex of all minus ones. Okay, it's easy to see that the Hamming distance to this particular set of two vertices is just the minimum of the proportion of ones and proportion of minus ones in the sequence. Plus there is some correction factor, which is the, the, this Gaussian width or Rademacher averages of the set of two points, which is just some small constant divided by square root of n. Right? So you know, if n is large, what this is saying is that as soon as the sequence is imbalanced, let's say 30% ones and 70% minus ones, you can predict the sequence better than 50%. In fact, you can get 30% uh, error rate as soon as the sequence is imbalanced. And you will, not get, you will not know that imbalance until the very end. So whatever, at the end of the day, whatever the imbalance is for the sequence, that's how many errors that you're gonna make. And this is not a, not, not, a, not a trivial result. If you think about how to do this, uh, um, you know, it will, it will take uh, quite a bit of time. I mean, no deterministic algorithm will get this, right? So this already puts you into the land of uh, kind of randomized prediction methods and it's not clear how to randomize. Um, one of the last papers by David Blackwell, maybe this is the, 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 the last one, in 1995, actually takes, looks at this example through the lens of his black hole approachability, which he developed in 1956, I think. Um, and and, and the, kind of talks about the, the fact that you're able to do this for any sequence, that you're able to predict this, any sequence that, uh, without any stochastic process, generative process on the sequence, uh, such that the number of mistakes is, is, is the minimum of the number of ones and minus ones within the sequence. Of course, if, if you assume Bernoulli distribution on the sequence, IID, then this is trivial, right? You just look at the empirical mean and then go with the majority. But the fact that you can do it with arbitrary sequences is quite, quite surprising. And so he, he muses on this fact that um, uh, there is this duality between the completely deterministic world where the predictions methods are uh, uh, randomized and the, the random world where you make an assumption about the distribution, but the prediction method is deterministic. 
Okay, so now we want to go back to our graph example. So we're, we're trying to make this applicable to uh, prediction on uh, social networks. So how, how can we uh, encode prior knowledge uh, uh, into this function phi? So let's start with the kind of the canonical example that's studied within the stochastic block model community, and that's the uh, this uh, political block data set, which is beaten to death. Um, you have a bunch of blogs, Democrat, Republican. There are more connections within the uh, Democrat blogs to each other uh, and respectively Republican than between. So what is the combinatorial structure of the graph that we're hoping to capture if we are to make predictions on this data set one by one? Well, we want to capture the homogeneity. We want to capture the fact that, the, um, that there will be a, a, a cut which is not too large. And if we know this cut, then hopefully, you know, the, 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 our predictions should be almost perfect. So the idea is, is, is to uh, look at uh, graph Laplacian. So you, you look at all labelings of all these n vertices, right? All the possible assignments of plus minus ones. So the, all, all the possible colorings of this uh, graph are exactly the vertices of the hypercube. Um, but the set that we like, the set that towards which we're going to strive, that this is our prior knowledge, is going to be encoded in the set F sub kappa of only those labelings whose graph Laplacian is small, okay? Kappa is some parameter that we need to choose. Okay, so, so uh, Laplacian is defined here as, a, uh, as the diagonal minus the adjacency, so hopefully people have seen this. Um, and this graph can be weighted or unweighted, so you can define the, the graph Laplacian accordingly. Okay. And, and more generally, you can define uh, the, the, the set um, as a subset of the hypercube using these kind of the ideas from constraint satisfaction, where you can, you can, you can instead of looking at uh, agreements or disagreements between the vertices of an edge, you can talk about triples and quadruples and, 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 and like smaller communities and so forth. So there are lots of lots of combinatorial structures that one can encode by going through uh, this constraint satisfaction. Okay. Um, so the, the, the kind of the bad thing is that these combinatorial constraints, that these cut-based constraints, become NP-hard um, very quickly. So if you have a, a, a weighted undirected graph, uh, so weights are given by W, then once again you write down the the set F sub kappa with the graph Laplacian. Uh, so that's the definition of the diagonal when the uh, weights are um, negative. So that makes the uh, Laplacian positive semi-definite. Um, you can see that the evaluating the Hamming distance to the set is as hard as computing the, this quadratic form, as, as hard as minimizing this quadratic form, okay? Uh, but if you take the examples when all the weights are negative, this becomes what's called the mean uncut uh, problem in computer science. And so you see that we, we can't make prediction with that uh, set F sub K, uh, F sub kappa. Okay. And the, the first idea, of course, if you see this, this, you know, if you know computer science literature on approximation, then you can say, okay, well, we're just gonna approximate this Hamming distance. But uh, we don't know how to make it work. I, I don't think that will work because you get the multiplicative approximation of the Hamming distance, and the multiplicative factor is, you know, uh, some, you know, constant or, or even log n or what have you. Um, but yet I can I can show that uh, you can get a mistake bound with a computationally efficient method for this problem. So th this this creates this uh, interesting uh, dichotomy that you you can't estimate the model, you can't you can't compute the best fit to data, given the model, right? You can't estimate this MLE, so to say, but um, you can have an efficient algorithm and suffer something in the uh, kind of speed of convergence or the sample complexity. Um, and and uh, of course, what we want is to, to understand how gaining in computation worsens our uh, prediction performance, right? So that, that's the question. And the idea is actually not too difficult. Um, so suppose that the set F is difficult to compute the Hamming distance to, okay? So it's, it's hard to, to 
uh, if you define the, uh, this weighted Hamming distance with respect to the set, it's just an NP-hard problem. Um, but suppose that you can relax this set into um, F prime, and uh, for this set somehow it's easier to, uh, to, f to find this uh, Hamming distance, okay? So we, we, we can extend the Hamming distance by writing it as a linear uh, problem. We can extend it to uh, all of Rn, and um, kind of a, tr a trivial observation is that, you know, we can define this new phi function with the relaxed set. Of course, we're gonna pay something more, right? So the Cn prime is the, the width of the set, the, the size of the set, and we have to pay something more. Um, but of course, the Hamming distance went down, so we get what we want, but we pay a little bit more, right? I mean, it's trivial. So how much more do we, do we pay? Well, we pay this ratio between the, the width of the new relaxed set and the width of the original set. But notice that we don't actually need the integral solution. We, we, when we calculate this phi prime function, um, you know, we, we, we extend the definition of the Hamming distance. We don't need to output the uh, integral solution. So that's uh, something quite interesting that you, you in, in many problems in the theoretical computer science, you, you have to round the solution. You have to worry about rounding. Um, but here, you, you just need to, um, uh, uh, to go with that uh, you know, semi-definite program, uh, for instance. Um, and the integrality gap only appears in the, in the theoretical analysis, in, in, the, in this ratio of Cn prime and Cn. Okay, so uh, the bottom line is that if we have an alpha approximation algorithm for uh, a CSP, then uh, you can get what we want, what, what I promised, online number of mistakes is upper bounded by the performance of the combinatorial benchmark, which we hope is small because you know, we entered our prior knowledge, for instance, that the graph is, is, is gonna have a small cut, okay? So then, then there is gonna be some s labeling which is separated into two parts and, and the, the performance of that labeling is going to be uh, good. And then here is something that goes to zero and it is the width of alpha times the number of constraints. So you see that here, the only thing that changed is a number of constraints became alpha times, alpha times larger. And typically alpha comes out from this calculation as square root of alpha. So effectively, um, this is what I promised. This is a bound that I promised. Okay, so actually getting this is, is a little bit, uh, maybe in the interest of time, I, I will skip this, but basically one has to go through, uh, um, define the set F prime implicitly through lifted representation of this uh, set um, and use pseudo distributions. This is something that has been developed in the theoretical computer science community, sum of squares and, and so forth. Um, but uh, but the, 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 the proofs are not too difficult. Okay, so of course, the, the, the kind of the, the, the final test is how well it does on the data. And so we did uh, extensive experiments. Um, and and uh, of course, I wouldn't sh be showing this if, I, if, it didn't go, if it didn't do well. But um, so this is the random play out. That's the method, the, the, the relaxed method that we're uh, um, running. This is on the political block data set, which has been beaten to death. Um, and and the, we end up making about 60 uh, errors, which is, okay, you can't really compare it, but within the, uh, the, the stochastic block model community, you know, everyone knows these numbers, like 52 is the best that one can get and, and, and so forth. Of course, you can't really compare this because here we're getting information sequentially and, and this, in the stochastic uh, block model, you have to kind of uh, do it all at once. You have to figure, uh, label the vertices all at once, it, it kind of in the classical uh, version of the stochastic block model. Um, but what's interesting is that we get good performance uh, on, on, on the data sets that um, where, where kind of spectral methods coming from the stochastic block models really fail. So, so here we're getting the relaxation based is again our method. We're, we've compared it to a bunch of methods and really gave a kind of a benefit of a doubt to the more classical machine learning methods. Um, but those methods are not de de um, developed with online in mind, right? So here we're really solving the online problem and those methods are developed for the batch scenario. Um, oh, I, I think I removed the, right, so, so there, was, there was a spectral uh, uh, kind of, I projected this graph on, on the second and third eigen dimensions and you can see that there is no separation between the pluses and minuses and so the spectral method just really fails. And, and yet there is signal in this data and, and these online methods can, can uh, 
pull, the, pull out the signal. Okay, so, um, so, so far uh, the idea was to model the set of solutions rather than the process that gives rise to them. This gives a kind of a robustness uh, guarantee to, to, the, to the methods that we develop. Um, we automatically get a number, a bound on the number of mistakes. We, we get to specify the number of mistakes that we're gonna make on each sequence. It sounds crazy, but uh, you know, the, 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 like the, this basic result is not very difficult. Um, it's a direct approach. We optimize the measure of success. We're, you know, the measure of success is the number of mistakes, and that's what we're optimizing. Instead of positing a stochastic, you know, a stochastic model, which I, 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 is also a perfectly fine approach, but uh, here we're just going after the prediction error because that's what the measure of performance is. Um, is it pessimistic? Well, you know, people, people say it might be pessimistic because you, you have a result that holds for all sequences without any generative model. Um, we can argue about this. Uh, I would say it's not pessimistic because we, we take the same assumptions and we encode them in the fee function rather than in the process that generates the data. Um, and, and it's key that the predictions are improper. If we had to do proper uh, predictions, we would be stuck in the NP-hard uh, land. Okay, so uh, if you look at uh, notes, then uh, you'll see that uh, there is a well-developed machinery now based on relaxation um, uh, where you can incorporate side information at the nodes, you have general cost functions, you have an evolving uh, network, um, and you can also deal with partial information. Um, if you're more theory inclined, then uh, this connection between probability and algorithms is actually quite uh, deep, uh, deeper than we thought. Um, in particular, you can you already already see that you can verify existence of algorithms. Uh, by checking some probabilistic inequality. And it turns out to be an if and only if uh, relationship that you can uh, um, prove certain inequalities by exhibiting an algorithm um, and, and, and ver vice versa. You can, you can verify existence of an algorithm by checking some uh, probabilistic inequality. Okay, so uh, let me, in the remaining 10 minutes, let me sketch the more general uh, approach. Um, Suppose you have side information, so the, the protocol is the following. On round t, you observe some side information about the person, you make a prediction y hat t, and then you observe the actual outcome. Um, this could be multi-class labels of you know, d uh, possibilities, but let's just say it's a binary, binary outcomes. So what do we do when we have a, a um, um, Covariates. Well, we, we set a, a class of functions with, that we hope uh, captures the relationship between the x's and the y's. Right? That's that's what we do in statistics and, and, and machine learning. Um, so you set a you 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 take a class of functions um, that map x into the prediction, and this could be you know linear classifiers. They can be neural nets, deep neural nets, very deep neural nets. What, what you know, what, whatever you would like. And then how do you construct the subset of the hypercube? The way that you construct this subset is by projecting the functions in the class onto the data. So imagine the data is given to you in advance, for, for just for a second. Then you would project the functions onto the data, and then you would incorporate the network constraints. You, you would intersect uh, with the network. So the, the, the idea here is that the algorithm should either go for the network constraints and pull information from the network to help you make predictions, from the, net, from the structure of the network, or you should go to this function class um, and, and, and um, get information from the covariates. So we're trying to fuse these two sources of information, which I uh, outlined in the beginning, where some information might come from the covariates and some other information might come from the network structure, and we would like to uh, have a method that fuses these uh, two sources. Um, and we have experiments I, I'm not gonna show you, but. Um, by tuning a parameter, you can see that if the signal from the covariates is too weak, then the algorithm goes after, this prediction method goes after the network uh, signal, and, and, and l l let's say like in a political block data set, if, if the two communities are separated. Um, and if you change the parameter and, and the network is more densely connected between the communities, you don't get enough signal, then it goes after the covariate information. Okay, so, so there are many difficulties um, with extending that simple 
situation to uh, the case of covariates, when you have covariates at the nodes. And one example, one difficulty is that f is not known until the end, because you don't know uh, the covariates. Uh, if you know the covariates of all the, at all the nodes, then, then uh, uh, the problem just extends. Uh, the solution extends. Um, we can also model the problem where the x's are random, x's are iid, um, and then f is a random subset, so we, we, we perform the, the, the certain uh, random playout uh, technique. So what is the relaxation idea? So the idea is that we need to make a prediction y hat t at time t, and that prediction should be based on uh, the covariates observed so far, including the covariate of this current step, my, uh, and the labels observed so far. And the idea is to, to write it as a kind of a potential function argument. So suppose that I can find a function phi such that I can guarantee that for any uh, y that I will observe, the loss will be bounded by the difference in this potential. I don't know how to create this phi function, but think of that phi function as that li little phi uh, that I presented before or some version of that little thing. Well then, of course, the number of mistakes, L is the loss function that compares the quality of my prediction to the actual outcome. Of course, then the, everything telescopes, and so we get the phi zero minus phi n, and that can be seen as the analog of this. So phi zero is, a, is something that's data independent, is just a constant, and then <laughs> phi n was the Hamming distance. So we're gonna say that this potential function phi is admissible if it satisfies the following recurrence. The minimum over my prediction, maximum over the outcome, the current loss plus the potential function is upper bounded by the potential function in the previous step. So if we can guarantee this and the final potential is larger than the benchmark, so think of this as the combinatorial benchmark, then we've got what we want. We've got what we want. Um, the question, of course, is, is uh, how to find these relaxations. And so ma the majority of the work goes into kind of coming up with uh, uh, systematic ways of, uh, of finding these potential functions. Um, and and, and uh, two techniques come hand in hand here. There are certain Martingale inequalities that one can check, and the other one is the, the von Neumann minimax theorem. So from these two techniques, one can verify these inequalities. Um, so uh, any phi which is admissible parameterizes an algorithm. So you come up with a new phi, that will be a new algorithm. So we have an interesting situation where we, we, know, we understand the space of algorithms, right? We would love to do this in statistics. We would love to look at the min max, min over estimators, max over distributions or problems, and then have some way of parameterizing the space of estimators. And people have looked at linear estimators and so forth. But here we have a, a kind of an algebra of, of these relaxations. Any fee that you take, uh, it parameterizes the, uh, the prediction method. Um, of course, if you have partial information, then the problem is, is, is more difficult. And, and these fee functions are functions of the information revealed so far. Uh, and, and this is more relevant in, in problems of advertisement where you don't know the outcome of the uh, so you display some advertisements, but the person just didn't click. So you don't know the, out, the, the value uh, that you would have gained had you displayed some other advertisement, let's say. Right. Um, so these are partial information problems, and, and uh, let me conclude with, 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 with uh, this more precise application, contextual multi-arm bandits. Um, so imagine that I am, I'm a host at the party, or you can think of these are as advertisements that you can put on the web, but okay, let, let's, let's say I'm a host at the party, and um, um, you know, people come to me asking for a drink, and then I serve them a drink. Um, and, and the classical multi-arm bandit uh, would say that you know, I, I, at the end of the day, I'm gonna focus on some absolutely best drink, uh, the drink that's best for everyone, right? But of course, there is no best drink for everyone, right? So there's like a hipster coming, and they like a, this type of drink, or maybe, uh, male versus female, uh, could be differences, okay? So you would like to make the, the predictions based on the covariates that you observe, right? So you, you observe the covariates and you make a, a choice of these drinks and then you observe, you know, where this, this person says a thumbs up or this person didn't like the drink 
And so you do observe the, the outcome for that drink, but uh, you don't observe any other outcomes, right? You don't, you, you don't know the, the counterfactuals, right? What, what would have happened had you served another drink? Um, so I'm okay assuming that X's are IID, that they're coming from some pool of people, you know, these are males, females, and just, there is some distribution. Um, uh, but I don't want to make assumptions on the, the way that the costs are evolving, because to model this problem uh, truthfully would require me to write down all kinds of dependencies, whether this person uh, you know, interacts with that person and so forth. Um, but instead, we're gonna make no assumptions on the cost and treat this as this individual sequence problem where the result will hold for any sequence of costs that happens to realize. For statisticians, this is really a strange uh, uh, notion that you can get a result for an individual sequence. Okay, this didn't compile well. So um, what we would like to have is, is, is an algorithm such that the, the average cost is compared to the best cost of a strategy that looks at the covariates and, and maps it into a decision, and you look at the cost of that uh, strategy, right? So you've collected a bunch of strategies, uh, that depend on the on, on the covariates. Maybe you think of F as the support vector machine with a multi-class running on, on the covariates. Um, and and um, you would like to have this guarantee with a, a small remainder. And this problem, uh, surprisingly, has been open for a long time um, with some progress made, but uh, in a very slow progress in some sense, contextual bandits. And, and the reason is because the, the space of algorithms is just not clear. It's not clear what one should do in this problem. Right? Um, and, and, and so let me conclude. Um, so the, the, the bottom line is that uh, you know, we can develop using the same machinery that I've outlined, we can develop a potential function. Okay, it looks like that. Um, uh, and and, and uh, an algorithm which is computationally very efficient and we've run it and it works very well. Um, and, and it's really coming from the same uh, kind of framework. Um, okay, so let me uh, uh, conclude by saying that um, uh, this is a, to me this is an exciting time because we have really a new toolkit for development of online methods, online algorithms um, that can work with combinatorial structures where the problem of estimation, if you, if you attempt to approach this problem as a statistician, it would just be an NP-hard problem. Um, there are some beautiful connections to empirical process theory, martingales. Uh, there are beautiful connections to, to um, um, optimization um, um, literature. Um, in this particular talk, I, I, I discussed the connection between the approximation algorithms, which has developed, been developed in the uh, theoretical computer science community, um, and the, the, the online relaxations. Uh, we have a knob for the accuracy versus computation trade-off. Um, uh, we have an improper learning technique, and this is crucial. Um, uh, and, and more generally, we have a, a prescription for incorporating uh, graph information and, and uh, other uh, information about the problem uh, uh, in, into this uh, uh, prediction scenario. Um, there is a tutorial that, that I posted uh, last night. Um, this is a tutorial with Karthik Sritharan, uh, which uh, we've written at a very basic level, so if, if you're interested in any, anything uh, that I said in this tutorial, uh, in, in this um, talk, then uh, please consult that tutorial. And the book is, you know, is a slow process, so at some point this will happen. Thank you. So um, we just started exploring these questions. Um, basically, what you, you, you the point is that you, you need to kind of 
explicitly or maybe implicitly, I think that would go with your question, uh, describe the set that you like, the subset of the hypercube. And that could be, you know, kind of like a, a, a clusters within the network and you kind of go over all these clusters. And the question is, you know, I guess one of the big questions is when can we have linear time methods uh, where the set would be maybe implicitly defined somehow? Um, and I think this is still a very interesting direction, but we don't, we don't know. Thanks. Thank you.